removed forever. And so it was just adjusted so that there would be this sort of trickle. But this is the dam uh, as it was breaking um, one day. So I take it it was much higher than in those days? The dam actually went up and filled this entire basin? It was it was a bit higher, but then it was also a lower drop down. A drop down so you can get the water wheel to pass. Yes. Okay. And then water wheels, you also have the option of putting your water wheel uh, six, eight, ten feet down below so the water still goes down, but you don't need the water source ten feet high. Right. You can adjust the wheel as, uh, as well. Uh, we're Frank Fowler. Frank Fowler and his wife were two painters. They were from Brooklyn. Uh, they had just returned, actually, from a number of years, both exhibiting um, and, uh, and um, uh, going to school for painting in Paris uh, and Florence. Uh, Frank Fowler was a well-known painter on that trip. Uh, he had contributed some frescoes to the Luxembourg Palace, so he's certainly a well-known uh, artist. He is Brooklyn-born, and when he returns here, uh, actually one of his big commissions when he comes back to New York, uh, is to provide frescoes also for the ballroom of the uh, Waldorf Astoria, um, Astoria Hotel on the site of where the uh, Empire State Building is today. So he's a well-known artist, and when he returns uh, back to New York after that jaunt in Europe, he settles in in this uh, uh, enclosure property that he purchases in 1890, 1891. Uh, he's joined by a friend of his, a uh, Arthur Hover. Um, Arthur Hover is also a, uh, a, a painter, a panel painter. Um, and he's also uh, New York born, but settles here. The area was certainly uh, conducive to New York artists because you could take the train at that point and commute into the city, but it was this beautiful, real country-like setting um, that was very close uh, uh, in terms of getting back and forth uh, to Manhattan. So they settled here. Arthur Hover, I'll mention, uh, you can see some of his paintings. There are two paintings, really great paintings by him, in our local library. There's a big, huge uh, landscape that's over the fireplace on the second floor and around the corner is an intimate portrait that he made of another uh, enclosure artist whose name was Arthur Elder. Um, so uh, it's worth taking a trip to the library to see uh, some of Arthur's. So he moves basically across the street from, um, from Frank Fowler and that begins this artist's uh, community. Not only painters, but writers too. Uh, in and around the enclosure. There's a figure named Henry Bunner, uh, who was actually the editor for many years of Puff Magazine in New York City, uh, who's one of the reasons, or I think the only reason, that Mark Twain made visits to um, uh, to Nutley from time to time was to visit this New York editor who was living uh, in this area of town. Uh, the reason that I stopped here is that you can see, and imagine this is before uh, any of these fences are up, uh, before this area is really developed. This is before there is a park in this area, when the back of these houses uh, that these artists uh, built who just spill down onto this really beautiful bucolic area. And you happen to be, or this direction behind you is north. Artists love northern light. The sun, of course, rises in the east, gets in the west, but on a southern tilt. So if you've got something, sun coming in from the south, it's constantly changing all day. What artists like is steady light. So the northern light never changes. And that's why uh, this area was particularly great on this side of the enclosure, and many of them built their artists studios, just like you see this one here, with a lot of glass uh, facing the north so they could both live uh, and paint there. Um, it doesn't stop with that generation. In 1900, Frederick Dana Marsh, uh, and a lot of people know him, he's a mural painter uh, out of Chicago, and his son Reginald Marsh, a very world famous illustrator, uh, lived on the enclosure actually in the same house that they bought from Frank Fowler after Frank's wife uh, died. Uh, 1941, there was a uh, Russian-born muralist who purchased that same house, 16 enclosure. Um, Michael Lenson, uh, who uh, actually you can see some of his work uh, in Newark City Hall. There are murals that he did there. Uh, he did the mural for the 1939 uh, New Jersey Pavilion at the World's Fair. So again, these are big name artists who all congregate for a number of generations. Um, I'm happy to tell you that even now, I think in 2006, the most recent artist, uh, Gary Urbay, who's from New York City, uh, New Jersey's own, uh, actually lives in the oldest house on the enclosure, a house that goes back to uh, to the 1840s. And you can see some of uh, Gary Urbay's work, Michael Lenson's work, this Frederick Dana Marsh piece uh, in our museum that will be open at the end of this tour. All right, I want to go a little bit further down here, and the next thing I'd like for you to, uh, uh, to think about is we're going to talk about uh, river as uh, inspir as a um, memorial, and why we are standing in Memorial Park and not just Nutley Park. Of well, the mud hole that I want you to look at tonight, uh, talk a little bit about river as symbol. Um, 
why is this memorial park right? Uh, and it was after World War I, uh, 1919, 1920, that the city began really thinking about how to honor its war dead. Uh, there were a number of different ideas that came up. There was a Nutley Memorial Committee that was appointed, um, and uh, uh, they bounced around a number of ideas. Did they build a tower? Uh, do they, they were getting ready to add on to an extension onto the high school. Do they name the high school um, for the veterans? Uh, do they build a hospital? Do they give them individual monuments? How would they handle that? Um, and it turned out that from about 1909, 1910, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we get to a different spot, but way back then, the city began to acquire property on both sides of the Third River with the idea of developing it into a park. They had simply acquired the property. Uh, by 1919, they hadn't done anything with it. Uh, the vote sort of whittled that, that list down every time there was another meeting uh, with the committee about what to get rid of this idea. We voted finally a parkway um, that winds its way through town was what was finally voted on uh, by the town, uh, by, by the Nutley Memorial Committee. So what they did was petition the town um, uh, elders to turn over the property that they had already purchased so that it could be developed into a, they had this beautiful parkway that naturally winds its way through town. And what they wanted to do was to um, simply develop it so that it could show its natural beauty. Uh, what they did in terms of memorializing veterans, veterans, uh, is that there were 17, by the way, 17 uh, uh, young men who were killed in World War I. Uh, underneath the trestle and near the trestle on the other side is a memorial stone that has a bronze plaque with their 17 names. Um, very diverse list. I could mention Stephen Dorr Jr., who uh, uh, must have been a wealthy young man uh, from one of those large houses on uh, Satterway Avenue, uh, who was the first Nutley son to have died. He was actually a pilot in training, never even made it across the ocean, he was killed in a training accident. Uh, with the Canadian Air Force um, uh, up in Toronto. So he was the first one uh, to die. I could mention William Harrison, uh, who was an African-American uh, soldier who dies um, uh, in World War I from Dudley. I could mention Albert Trzewski. Albert Trzewski is a Polish immigrant who comes here in 1917 with his married sister to make a new life here, loves this country, um, signs up, and he is uh, uh, killed a few years later um, serving his adopted country. Um, I'll end that list with Raymond Blum. Uh, Raymond Blum is one of the privileged, comes from one of the privileged families of Nutley. His father um, uh, was a successful merchant, uh, then went on to become the first full mayor of Nutley um, in about 1912. Uh, he uh, is uh, in a high position with the fire department when he gets word that his son, uh, his name is Abraham Blum, that his son Raymond Blum uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has been killed. Uh, there's a bridge, the little bridge that you walk over on the way here that is called the Blum Memorial Bridge. Raymond Blum's family gave that bridge in 1919 um, to the park as a memorial not only to his son but to all of those, uh, to all of those killed. Um, so 17 were killed, but 427 um, served. They wanted to honor all of those as well. And so the fundraising campaign to get this park going, they tried to get about ten or twelve thousand dollars, which is what they felt they needed to fund phase one. Phase one being from uh, Chestnut Street by Town Hall to where we started. Uh, phase two and three going towards Kingsland uh, were to come another day. So for this first part, the fundraising uh, slogan was a tree for each who served. What they asked for was a $25 donation from every Nutley citizen who wanted to uh, to purchase a tree. It would be done and actually would be chosen and would be named for one of those 427. It was going to be chosen by lot. Um, in terms of what kind of tree and the placement of it so that it was all very democratic. So when you look here and you see the beautiful placement of these trees and the simplicity of this park, um, that's where all of this comes from. Again, these trees were planted when this park was developed about 1919, 1920, um, uh, and it's 427 at least at that point planted for those uh, who served, and not only the 17 names on that plaque, but also uh, 17 special trees in the grove of Santis uh, around that golden memorial. What they also did, and we're going to show you two pieces, two parts of this back at the museum, uh, was that uh, they were looking $10,000 for the park to develop it. They were willing to spend $1,000 on about 18 gold leaf frames that had hand calligraphy the names of all 427 that were displayed um, uh, in the library, actually, uh, uh, at first, and then turned over to the Historical Society much later. There were a couple of those that I pulled out that honor roll 
um, that you can see there too. And finally, they did uh, give each individual um, soldier who served um, a bronze medal, thanking them for, nothing, for their sacrifice uh, uh, for that war, that end of World War. Okay, um, the next stop, and actually when we turn this way, um, so right view this way, as we turn this way uh, and start to walk, just be aware of what I would call the sluice way on your left. The Yantikor, the third river, is on our right. The sluice way or the raceway uh, is the artificial man-made uh, tributary that would have been hard to have filled up the dammed area uh, that would have provided the power to turn the water well. So we're going to be walking down the river. Uh, rivers are natural boundaries, and uh, the Yantico or the Third River is, uh, is no different than a lot of them. In fact, going back as far as uh, 1666, the first Newark contract uh, where the English purchased this property uh, from the Native Americans, um, the borders went something like from the Passaic River uh, to the Wachung Mountains. Uh, to the Wachung Mountains. Um, and from uh, uh, Newark Bay, uh, as you traveled north of the Passaic, uh, to the Yantikor or to the Third River. So it was a border of that original 1666 contract. Um, when the Van Giesen House, or the Vreeland House, or the Women's Club, whatever we call it, the next building that we're going to see on this tour, when that piece of property was purchased, when that estate was broken up in 1783, the border of that property, and this is a portion of the original property, goes from the Yanacor River to the Passaic River. So again, for that, um, and that's a, a rather large piece of property, but even that, the borders were these natural borders, the Yanacor River. Um, the Yanacor also doesn't look like much right now behind me, but it really separated uh, this property, whether I will call it um, Newark, which we were, of course, a part of way back when, whether I'll call it Bloomfield, whether I'll call it Belleville, um, whether I'll call it Franklin, or filter down to Nutley, take your pick at what different time eras we're in, uh, the Yanacor River split this section into east and west. I and mean, if you see this map here, it just shows you, and by the way, this map also shows you all those different dammed areas where you see it gets fat. It doesn't get fat on its own. It got fat because somebody built a dam there, sort of tapped into the power. But it shows you how it really splits this town into two. Franklin and Nutley, when we were Franklin, Franklin and Nutley even after we became Nutley. So even within the town, uh, this river does function, and it, it really functioned in the past, as that border. Um, I think more cultural than physical, the idea back then was that Franklin was the business part of town. That's where town hall was. Uh, the other side, when you crossed into Nutley, that's when you got into um, Henry Bunner, the editor of Puck Territor Territory, and that artist colony. So it was broken up into this very business part of town, at least by reputation, because the enclosure, by the way, did develop this reputation as a uh, sort of suburban <laughs> Greenwich Village left bank kind of artist yeah, community. Yeah. So those two um, identities of this town uh, existed on both sides of, of this um, river. Um, I mentioned... Uh, someone had asked earlier, and this is a good spot to talk about, Yantikov versus Third River. Um, why is it called one? Why is it called the other? Yantikov, of course, is the Native American uh, term for it, and it basically means two things at once. It means the harvest ceremony that the Native Americans would hold um, on the banks of the Passaic River um, uh, in the fall before they would go down, like all of us, to the Jersey Shore. They would go down there to the winter uh, to feast on shellfish when the hunting and the harvesting was over uh, in this area. They'd come down from the Watcher Mountains, different tribes would gather um, at a spot where the Yantikor River flows into the Passaic, where it joins that. Um, that marshy field around there was called Yantikor because that's where Yantikor, that ceremony, took place. So the Yantikor River basically means uh, the river um, where the harvest ceremony takes place. And you contrast that with, um, uh, with Third River. Third River was the name given by the English as they sailed up to their um, areas here and they wanted to know where they were. Uh, the first major tributary that fed into the Passaic as you were traveling from its mouth uh, at Newark Bay was the first river. The second one was the second river. The third one, this one, is the third river. And I think it's a great contrast between those two cultures, one that uh, would name this body of water after their harvest ceremony and the place where they would dance for uh, a number of days and meet their relatives before going down the shore, as opposed to the third left upstream. Um, so again, the English, I think, versus the, uh, the Native Americans for that. Uh, behind me here, these 
and, and I'm not quite sure why this particular building was allowed to come so close to uh, to the banks of the Yantikor. Most everything else, as I mentioned, when the city started to acquire property back in the uh, um, 1910, uh, 1909, uh, they wanted to go back at least 50 to 100 feet on both sides of the banks uh, against any private property, but I'm not quite sure why this is here. These date from the middle 40s, 1946, 1947, um, and actually prior to them, uh, this is what it looked like. Again, I'll pass this around. Uh, these were part of the Vreeland estate. They were orchards. And then the Winton family, um, who we all know as right. still businessmen in town, um, raised phantom roosters and also had um, peach orchards in all of this property behind me. Uh, you'll see the road here is what a part of it becomes Warren Lane because Warren Vreeland, and you know that Warren Lane goes into Greenland Avenue at one point. That's why those are named for that. And here in 1929 is the public safety building that was put up. Okay. Um, which, which is the correct spelling for Yanikov? Uh, it depends on who's asking and who's oh, okay. writing and when they're writing. Okay. You see it as uh, T-I-C-A-W. You right. see it as K-A-O-U-T. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of different spellings. Um, and but even the signs in town are different. Even the signs and towns, they would be going back to whatever document they would have been looking back oh, okay. on. But there was not standard spelling even of a lot of English words until okay. more recent than okay. you would imagine. So it was sort of however somebody heard that word and translated it into their Dutch, into their okay. English. Okay. So there's a lot of different, uh, I yes. think the standard one is T-I-C-A-W. Uh -huh. uh, they moved inland, uh, think of the Kingsland uh, uh, Manor as well. They've always situated when you can, right on the banks of the river. Uh, and again, the Van Giesen house is no different. Uh, there is a myth and a reality to the uh, house. I'm going to tell you the myth, and then Jesse, who is one of the key club students, will tell you some of the realities of it. But the myth is that this dates back to 1702, that this building was built in 1702. Uh, it in fact was not. It's built about a half century later. That comes from the fact that there was a uh, Greeland, the first Greeland estate, in fact, does date to 1702, was on the banks of the Passaic River in town. Um, doesn't exist anymore today. The assumption was that this was built at the same time. Uh, this was not even built for the Vreelands. Uh, this was built for a family named the Van Giesens. Um, and I'll let the story of the person the story over. The house was built in 1751, and it was built by uh, Bastian Van Giesen. And the Van Giesens were a part of a loyalist family during the Revolution. So actually, after constructing this house, they uh, fled to New York. And someone from the Van Giesen family in 1783 sold the house to Revolutionary veteran Captain Abraham Spears, and he bought the property. Uh, a year later, Mr. Spears sold the house in 1784 to John Vreeland, and the Vreelands had this home uh, as a part of their estate until 1912. And in 1912, the house was handed over to the Women's Club of Nutley, and the Women's Club has had this home for a um, hundred years and now in 2012, and actually this year the Women's Club is handing the home over to the Nutley Historical Society, and the Nutley Historical Society is going to make it part of the Nutley Museum and add to the exhibit. Um, if you can see on the outside of the house, uh, I'm just going to go on outside. There's A, B, G, and uh, here's, here's, this one says 1702, which is part of the myth, or I think there's um, an L, V, which is part of the Vreeland. So anyone that owned the home, um, it says the year that they owned it, and it says a little bit about them. So I thought that was uh, pretty cool. Uh, the the house is a simple home. It was made of ground stone. It has a central entrance right here and rooms on either side with a fireplace. Um, and actually, I think we could walk inside, yeah, right? Yeah. So, say a little. Understanding is that the myth is that it was seized by the. That's what the plaque says. So I see part of everything. Everything on the plaque is wrong. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I've read, and that seems to be sort of the old history that everybody kind of clung to. Um, it, I have not seen the transactions, but what I've read is that the transactions are all legal sales. 
So I think what it was was a relative of the Van Beesens. They didn't give up property. They certainly fled and abandoned it, meaning they did not stay around for the festivities. Yeah. Uh, because in a lot of cases, I think people actually lost their property. Their right. property was, in fact, confiscated. But what it does it. say is that it shows that, 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 that uh, Spear uh, actually did purchase it from a very good price. So maybe some member of the Van Beesens was a loyalist. That leaky in the way you know, 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 Taylor, talk a little bit about the bedroom upstairs, and then we could actually uh, cycle around up there real quick. What, what, we'll, what we'll wind up doing is, I think, 25 of you, or sort of generally half of you, and if you maybe two of you can yeah. lead them up. We'll go upstairs because it's not, it's a great old stone house. It's by no means, as you can tell, a mansion, and it's very tight upstairs. We all would not fit. So I think a couple of, you know, half of us going up, it's worth looking at those trusses. There's a small bedroom to sort of peek into, and then the next crew up, and then we'll. 1776, as Washington's troops were being pursued by General Cornwallis. Um, Martha Washington had slept in a bed in the bedroom upstairs, and the bedroom has not been moved since. The same bed is still there. So I thought that was a very cool fact, but I never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> and as you are walking up towards the stairs, I think I've got this right, on the wall to the right is a, looks like a plexiglass opening. Uh, what that shows you is the, uh, the mud um, and the wood. That's the construction of the house. So you can see that, I think, as you go up. What's that? Insulation, yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. I was thinking, you know, yeah. I didn't think of him as a little... Yeah. Where's Barry? Wow. Martha's bed. Where is that? So this is basically one bedroom kind of a thing, or...? Uh, yeah, I guess downstairs would have been a public space. I imagine this would have been a bedroom that you would have walked through to get here.